Mark chapter 9, the examination for today, beginning with verse 42, the verses that were read, the sermon that I have entitled, Separating from Sin. Separating from Sin. I think about this past year that we have we've gone through and and I think of the many diversions that we have had and and many stumbling blocks and many distractions that we have had in this life and those distractions never really truly go away because the enemy the devil makes it his ministry his mission to place stumbling blocks in our path to keep us tripping and falling for the rest of our lives. But sometimes it is in our strength, it is in within our reach to kick those stumbling blocks off of that path. There is a very obscure passage, it seems obscure, the very end of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21. The very last thing that John writes in this epistle is, little children, keep yourself from idols. Now, strikingly, this phrase is only used in this place. And the command is to guard yourself against anything which occupies the place owed to God. So let me ask you this before I move on. Is Jesus worthy of worship? Seems like a nonsensical question, doesn't it? But the sin of idolatry, or this command in fact, would be to guard yourself against everything which occupies the place that is owed to God. And by the way, this is an ageless message. You'll hear this from the pulpit, at least in my preaching ministry, until the Lord calls me home or calls someone else. To keep yourself from idols. This implies that we have a bit of human agency in kicking those stumbling blocks off of the path. Things that would keep you from worshiping the king of all creation things that would keep you from giving your adoration to Jesus alone. But it seems that this verse, keep yourself from, there is a bit of responsibility from you and I. See, idolatry is such a detriment to worship within the church that it prevents people from coming to church. Now, I use that very loosely, that phrase. In the publication called the British Weekly Pulpit, This is a publication that came out in the 20s, 1923. It was printed in this particular issue of how idols keep us from worship. I want you to remember that this publication and this particular print was 1923. Listen to these words that he writes about idolatry and see if there's a striking resemblance in the day that we live. He says, do not children encourage the passion of exciting amusements until they are miserable without them. Though so many many innocent recreations remain to them, we have known children whose Sundays were a weariness to them and their studies a punishment. Imagine that. Studying God's word is more of a punishment than it is an enjoyment. He said their pleasure is in their idols. And I've got to say our pleasure must be in Christ. But people have found substitutes that I would even submit can be anti-Christ. Not that the thing that, that... that exist is antichrist, but the place that we put it in our lives becomes antagonistic to the gospel. They pull our attention away from Jesus. But Jesus uses an illustration today, the physical, the here and the now, to make a very striking 
charge against idolatry and sin. In the world of radical global skepticism, and what that simply means is a global skeptic would say that I can't know if there is a God or if there's truth, and you can't either. Of course we can. But in this realm of skepticism, there is a clarion call to measure all things in life by means of empirical data. Meaning that they do not factor in faith or supernatural at all, but all information that leads to certainty for them is found in the exterior world and the things, the data that invades our senses, the things that we can smell, the things that we can touch, see, and taste. Now, without getting much into trying to dismantle this way of thinking that is not viable and you definitely certainly can't live it out, I bring this up to make a point about Jesus. Because Jesus selects the senses to make a very valid and hard-hitting point against idolatry and sin. So he selects the empirical instruments of sin. The hand, the foot, the eye, those things that lead someone to sin. To make a drastic and damaging illustration of the effects of sin and idolatry. And so in today's message, we will examine what might lead you to sin and what might be some things that you must refrain from that which right now grips you tight and attempts to draw you closer to it, and that being idolatry. So if you remember last week, Jesus is approached by the apostle John. And John is confronting Jesus about a person that has been casting out demons or devils in the name of Jesus. It's this fellow over here, Jesus, I just want to let you know about him. We did our due diligence. We have rebuked him because he hasn't been following with us. I just want to let you know our noble act for today, Jesus, is we rebuked him. He is not, he is not to... Cast out demons in your name. Jesus says this in verse 39. Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Watch him. If he doesn't diverge from that truth, then he is of me. If he doesn't speak ill or harmful of me or speak ill against my name, he is doing a work in my name. For the one who is not against us is for us. And so we underscored this, this great truth and reminder that there are many times in ministry where we must, I almost believe, we must cross denominational lines. And other times when we must not cease to cross that ecumenical threshold, this all religions in one place at one time. Sound teaching on salvation and rightful worship of Jesus is the, the superlative, the determining factor. If there is anything added to the work of Jesus, if there is anything added to salvation, we run from that teaching. And so this little nugget of truth is sandwiched right between the usage of little children. As, as Mr. Dick read earlier, Uses of children as a, an illustration of humility. It picks up in verse 42. says this, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone tied around his neck and he thrown into the sea. That's how offensive it is. To put a stumbling block in the way of someone growing in their faith. And this could be little children. This could be, this could be adults. This could be uh, new believers. If you cause anyone to stumble in their faith, it could be like this great millstone. Man, I don't want to be in that place, do you? I mean, that can be a standalone sermon in itself. And I know that many pastors have stood and preachers have stood and preached on this. And these little ones, I mean, again, they could be children, they could be new believers, they are ones who are weak, who might be weak in their faith or immature in their faith. More so for anyone that would say or do anything to hinder one from believing or become mature in their faith, judgment is coming. 
I know some people who do not come to church because they said the last time that they came, someone said something about the dress that they had on. It wasn't of quality. Another gentleman said, I don't go back to that church anymore because they expect me to have a shirt and tie and a jacket on every time I come through the door as if it is a dress code. Automatically judging one's economical status. I don't want, I don't want to hinder anyone from growing in their faith. And so... Jesus gives this very sharp reminder. He uses the image of this large wheel-shaped millstone tied around the offender's neck and cast into the sea and to keep one from growing in their faith. Children, new believers, etc. is a serious offense. And so Jesus uses this illustration in such a way as if he is pointing at his disciples and pointing to them, remember that. Remember what I just, remember what I just told you. And he moves on to the offenses of sin or some very specific but vague points in some way. And we'll explain that in just a moment. So I've got to ask, I'm going to ask you two questions as we look at this text. Two questions. The first question will be to you. What must you cast away? What must you cast away? Beginning at verse 43, the Lord Jesus says, If your hand causes you to sin... Cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to go with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, you tear it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God than with one eye than with two to go to hell. Where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. So in verse 41, the offense is, is empirical things that he mentions. It is, if it causes you to sin or to stumble, these verses would say to cast it away. Now before he had talked about the sins of others, or he had talked about if you have offended a little children. It is uh, if you cause another one to stumble, if, if you have caused another one to sin, new in their faith, a child or otherwise, that judgment is likewise coming. And in these particular verses, from what I read on from verse 42 on through, it is those individual sins, those things that you and I deal with, the things that we might have in our life that are enabling us to keep on living in sin and idolatry. And so the question is, what must you cast away? What would be one of the most extreme things that you can think, out, think about to keep one from sinning? In this ascetic way would be, I damage my body in some way. I cut my hand off. If I have a problem with stealing, I cut my hands off. If if I have a problem with lust, I pluck my eyes out. And if I have a problem with lying, I, I lop my tongue off. You know, although Jesus doesn't say that, it, the illustration would follow. But Jesus was using this radical illustration to teach the spiritual truth that spiritual health and vitality is of the utmost importance. And anything that hinders your growth in Jesus needs to be removed. But he didn't expect his disciples to take this literally, literally you don't think, do you? Did he expect his disciples to go out and physically remove their limbs or eyes or tongue? Or would it be better to understand this as to simply cast off those things that lead one to sin? And so if your hand offends you, he says, cut it off. Better to be without one hand, right, than to, than to sin. Better to cut it off than, than to go to hell with two, right? What endangers your walk with the Lord must be removed from your life. Think of it like this. A surgeon with a skilled hand can take that scalpel and can remove the foreign bodies from your body. If, 
let's say, is removing cancer with a fine scalpel or removing something that needs to be removed. A a surgeon with a a fine-tuned scalpel can remove something cancerous in such a way we must remove those things from our life with surgical precision as to not haunt us again. Jesus uses this word here, Gehenna, which we understand this to be a trash heap on the outside of Jerusalem that burned non-stop. It was always burning with somebody's refuge, some trash or something that they would take them to the burn heap. I could not imagine the stench that would come from this, this burning hall that is described as Gehenna. He uses this trash heap as an illustration of eternal punishment that never ends. And the, and the worm and the fire of Gehenna is a picture of destruction. The worm dies not. And the fire of Gehenna burns forever and ever. Literally, these are things in this trash heap. These are things that causes destruction. And so Jesus makes this parallel. Because there are things in your life that will lead you to sin. And this sin will be destruction for you in this lifetime. If they are not discarded, if they are not discarded in this life, they will cause you so much destruction, so much distortion, that your life in Christ will be so distorted that you will look more like the world than you do like Jesus. Maybe for some of us today, we need to call on Jesus the surgeon to remove those things from our life that are hindering our worship. Remove those things that we have placed in our lives that have become a stumbling block for us worshiping Jesus. Call upon Jesus like the grand physician, the surgeon, to remove those things from our life. So yes, Jesus uses these body parts. It helps us get a picture of hands and feet and eyes, those empirical things that invades our senses all the time. But there are things that we can place in our life that would keep us from walking on that path again and tripping over those stumbling blocks along the way. So we know that Jesus was not commanding them to take this literally, thank the Lord. All right, I would imagine if I was to survey the congregation this morning, and if this was literal, there would be some people without some tongues in here, without some eyeballs, there would be some people in here without some feet and some hands, because we would be constantly surgically removing these things that causes us to sin. So thank the Lord that this is not literal in its sense. But what do we imply? For instance, if there is one who has a problem with pornography, you have an accountability partner. You have someone that you call on that says, I'm having a hard time with this. I believe in Jesus. I'm a believer. I'm saved, but I have a struggle with this. Can you help me? A lot of times people don't want to do that because it is encroaching upon their private time. But drastic times lead to drastic measures. You call an accountability partner. Someone that monitors the sites that you visit online. They know where you visit online. If you have a problem with integrity, being a man or woman of your word, keeping your promise, have someone in your life that will hold your feet to the fire. You said you were going to do this. Let's carry it through. If you have a problem with commitment, much like with integrity, have someone that will hold you accountable. You see the pattern, don't you? We need people in our lives. There is no such thing as an isolated child of Jesus Christ. There's no such thing, even though there might think there might be, there's no such thing as a person growing in their faith in isolation from others. We need folks to hold us accountable under the authority of God's Word. In church history, there is a well-known recording of one by the name of Origen. Origin of Alexander, he lived from 184 to 253 AD. And Origin, you would spell it O R G E N for those who might want to research Origin of Alexander. He was, he's more well known for a 
a rendition of, of the scriptures, but he's also known for something in church history that is called Origen's Rash Act. The church historian Asubius, in chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 of his work, of Origen's notorious rash act, he recalls the account of a notable rash act undertaken by Origen that sprang from, and I quote, an immature and youthful mind. Origen lusted after girls and ladies who was way younger than he was. He took Christ's commands that are those who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom in Matthew 19 and verse 12 in too literal and an extreme sense. And apparently, he emasculated himself. And so you heard me say that right. I know that has drawn your attention. And I did read that right without going into detail of that. He said to have done this out of faith and self-control as to avoid any hint of scandal in his instruction of women. And so Origen took the commands of Scripture in this way a little too far. But the core teaching is sound, which is cast away the thing that causes you to fall and have someone to hold you accountable. And you know, we live in a world where people don't want you to meddle in their affairs. I've even heard people say jokingly, preacher, now you're meddling. And we live in that world. When we don't want people to meddle in our private lives or become nosy in our private lives. But in some regard, I think the church must meddle a little bit. And I don't mean out of a way of meanness or gossip or slander, but I mean out of love. I'm glad that I've got some men and some women who will meddle a little bit in my life. I am glad that I've got some people that will come to me and say, Preacher, I know uh, I don't want you to be mad at me, but I've got something I need to talk to you about. I've got some men who would say, I, I've got something I've got to get off my chest. I'm glad that I've got some people in my life that will meddle a little bit. And I want people to do so if they are doing it out of genuine love and concern. But I have also known to see this culture that is individualistic, that is narcissistic. And this culture does not want nothing to do with people investing in one another's lives. I just want to be left alone. I want the white picket fence around me. And no one can encroach upon my property Speaking of my own personal space. But we must cast away today to ensure that the worm that dies not and the fire that is unquenchable, those things that are illustrated as destruction, that our life is not bent for destruction. I can't tell you how many times when you see a husband and wife divorce, how many people that that affects or something of infidelity, I should say, in the family, how many people on that family tree it affects. Not only that, but people on the outside, friends and family, work that it affects. What is the thing that you must cast off today? My second question to you has a lot to do with the first question, meaning what, mean, what must you separate from? But have you lost your saltiness? Now I know that as soon as I read that, pop cultural references have flooded your mind. You think of saltiness in the way of a person might carry their demeanor today as ill or a short-tempered, uh, that type of thing. But that is not what Jesus is speaking of. He's speaking of saltiness in the sense of preservative. And how is a child of God a preservative to the world around us. Well, in verse 9, he says, For everyone, everyone will be salted with fire. And by the way, this is only used here in the Gospel of Mark, this mixture of salt and fire. Verse 49 is only recorded here, but it is, it's a sense of salted with fire. It's, it's, it's not like the judgment that we saw earlier before. 
So it means a little something different. Jesus is using, Jesus is using fire in two different ways. The fire of judgment and the first rendering. And now this last portion, verses 49 and 50, he is using fire in the way of purity. Purging, purity. In fact, 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 6 says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So let me ask you this before I move on to verse 7. Have you had various trials in your walk with Jesus? Everyone. Verse 7, he says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. So this sense of fire and salt has to do with preserving and purity. There's a goal here, to be preserved and to be purified. Verse 50, salt is good, but if if it's lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? How will you gain that influence? How how will you gain that thing that makes you a preservative to the world? Maybe the world has, the, the church has lost its preservative factor because we have failed in proclaiming the good news. The world is falling and crumbling around us and and yet sometimes we think we have no responsibility, if you will, to preach the gospel to the world and thus our influence is null and void. The Lord Jesus focuses on these, this element of salt. It's good, he says. It's a good seasoning, that is, unless you have high blood pressure like me and then you got to watch your salt intake, but he's not talking about seasoning on food or the overusage of salt on your food as a seasoning. In these days, it was used to preserve, and this isn't anything new. You've heard this if you follow any type of history of the world. You know that this was used as preservative to keep the food edible, to keep it a little longer. It it was not so much used for taste as it was to preserve and to keep. For instance, the Christ follower are to be to the world something that is good and something that preserves. So what would be some things that the church must be engaged in in the world. We need to be a voice piece for those who can't speak for themselves. We we, we are a voice piece for those who are uh, the life in the womb. We are a voice piece for those who are elderly. We are a voice piece for those who are burdened by whatever reason it might be. Uh, We are a voice to the world in some regard that is good. And we, in some way, we are preservatives to the sanctity of human life. We believe that everyone is created in the image and likeness of God and has dignity. And they have a right to live. But we have lost our preservative factors in this. And the the life of a devoted Christ follower must be to the world a source of an example of rightful worship and spiritual vitality. Saltiness in this sense would be you and I pointing people towards Jesus. And in some way, many, uh, uh, many ways, this saltiness comes through standing against the evils in the world, standing for true justice and not this cheap imitation of Western social justice that has overswept our country. Cheap imitation of God's ultimate justice. But it is when Christ followers fail to be salt to the world is when we begin to see the plight of society. When Christians have lost their influence in culture is when we began to see society nose dive. It is when we lose influence in the world that we have lost our saltiness and our ability to preserve or our ability to, pe- to speak in the public square. But on the flip side, sometimes people are more salty than what they realize. Meaning, instead of standing for truth of the gospel, we substitute it for standing on political parties. 
or superimposing our own version of the gospel that purports something that is counter to the gospel. I, I remember hearing a preacher tell me that if I didn't vote, I was in sin and going to hell. So maybe a, a, an oversaltiness, which is damaging too, would lead to something that is counter to the gospel. But there's a balance, isn't there? Just like when we season our food with salt, there's a, a balance, something that is just right there. And when we become like that, when we were overzealous or not zealous enough, we become good for nothing. And the Bible describes this salt as trampled under the feet and thrown out in the street, almost good for nothing. And when we lose our influence, the gospel influence, we are like that salt that is trampled down out in the street. So let me ask you, do you feel as if the church today is like that salt thrown out, good for nothing in the street? Now, I'm not just speaking of Piney Grove. I'm speaking about the church as a whole. Let me ask you this. Do you believe, do you see the church losing its influence in culture? Then it is time for us to move outside of our little bubble and build more on the kingdom of Christ, big K, instead of the small K, kingdom of whatever church we would belong to. We have become so inner focused that we have lost our saltiness. So the question that is in the text is, how will you be salty again if you have lost it? How will we become a preservative to the world? And the answer is in the text. If we read too fast, we'll miss it. But it's right there in the text to be a preservative to the world. Here it is. Here is the answer to this. To be at peace with one another. You know, the greatest apologetic for the Christian faith is not articulating the points of the existence of God. It is not trying to point to God as creator, although we believe those things, and to try to build a defense of that. The greatest apologetic for the church today, the greatest apologetic is not a defense of the Bible or the existence of God, but is to show the world that our genuine faith has led us to genuinely love one another. That is our greatest defense, our greatest pointing to, if you will, our greatest examination of the Christian faith, our greatest apologetic, Defending of our Christian faith is to show our genuine love to one another. John 13, 35, very familiar verse says, And by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It doesn't say by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you can articulate the five premises for the existence of God. It will not say by this you know all people all people will know that you are my disciples if you can lay some groundwork for the validity of the Word of God. It doesn't say if you can lay out the, the greatest explanation for the empty tomb is that Jesus rose again. Now those are good, by the way. By this, people will know that you are mine if you love one another. In closing... Let me ask you these questions and it will close. What must you cast away? What must you, by the aid of God himself, assist you with, his Holy Spirit, to cast away from your life? What is the thing that is keeping you from wholly devoting your life to him? And by the way, devoting your life to him has so much more to do than attending church on Sunday morning. That is a wonderful thing. We're glad we can do that. But it means serving Him when we leave this place. What must we cast away? And then, have you lost your saltiness? Have you lost your influence to preserve? Have you lost your influence on your friends? Maybe you have a friend or a family who at one time would listen to 
to you share the good news with them and whatever reason do not value your, your views anymore. Now I know the Lord and his sovereignty is going to save who he's going to save. But there's something about a Christ follower walking in unison with him and loving one another that lends a great testimony to our God and that he reigns, that he is in control, and he has called his church to influence culture and not culture to influence his church. Let's pray.